Welcome to The Hair Loss Show. Dr. Russell Knudsen and Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash discuss issues relating to hair loss and the medical and surgical treatment of hair loss in both men and women. Hi everyone and welcome to The Hair Loss Show, episode number four. My name is Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash. And I am Dr. Russell Knudsen. Welcome. All right, so last episode, we went through, uh, so previously we've gone through male pattern hair loss. We've covered, um, the start covering therapy and, and how we use finasteride, finasteride to stabilize male pattern hair loss. We've talked through the mechanism of how that works. And again, if you're unclear of that, please go back through to episode two and three and, and, and hopefully you'll get a, a recap uh, through there. But uh, I thought today okay. we'd uh, drill down a little bit more on uh, finasteride because, again, as I, as I said in the last show, it's one of the things, it's one of the biggest pushbacks that I get when we see patients on a, on a day-to-day basis. One in terms of people not wanting to start therapy because they've heard and read too much uh, about it and they're scared of, uh, um, of starting. Uh, secondly, pe- oh, people start it and then stop because they don't know it needs to be long term. Um, so why don't we sort of unpack that a little bit and, and, and go through what the implications of taking uh, Fresno and what, you know, what are the pros and cons from that perspective? Right. Okay, so finasteride was introduced in Australia in 1998. So we've had over 20 years of experience with it. So that's something that's important to consider. We had a lot of experience with this drug. Millions and millions of men around the world have taken it. We have very, very good information about what's possible with the medicine and what's not possible with the medicine. Unfortunately, the internet perpetuates a lot of myths about finasteride uh, that uh, scare people. And so many, as Dr. Vikram said, many people come into our surgeries and say, I'm not prepared to take it because I've heard you get side effects. And I'm able to say to them that if you're getting a side effects, you're not going to be taking it. So there aren't people in my practice who are taking it that are having side effects. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on it. So let's talk a little bit about uh, finasteride again. As we mentioned in the last podcast, this, the action of finasteride is to block the enzyme. So it's an enzyme blocker, not a DHT blocker. And what that means is that we block some of the enzyme activity which blocks some of the conversion of testosterone to DHT. In that scenario, the DHT level goes down and the T level goes up, okay? So, why would people get side effects if you're not actually altering the hormones? Our suspicion is it's because the DHT is a slightly stronger version of testosterone than testosterone. So there's more testosterone in the body, less DHT but DHT pound for pound is a slightly stronger hormone. So how did finasteride happen? Well, the drug was actually developed for people with enlargement of men with the enlargement of the prostate gland, not a cancerous uh, enlargement, a non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate gland that they had worked out was also a function of overactivity of the enzyme and too much DHT in the prostate. So they started treating the prostate in these men with finasteride and found to their amazement that some of these balding men with enlarged prostates started to stabilize and reverse their balding. So it was an accidental finding. It wasn't a targeted finding that they were expecting. So the drug has been around for longer than just for treating people with hair loss. It's been around longer because we used to also use it and we still do for people with enlarged prostates. So basically we discovered when we were doing it for hair that you didn't have to use the same dose. So for example, for men that are using the prostate, there is a five milligram tablet that they take every day. But for the hair, the recommended dose is a milligram. And the reason it's recommended at a milligram is because if you track the response curve versus the dose curve, I know that's a bit technical, it kind of flattens off at about one. And what that really means is that more isn't better. Okay, more is not better. A milligram is enough. Now where I'm going to be a little controversial with you today is talking about what the correct dosing is. 
because the recommended dose on the packet says a milligram per day, right? In other words, you're supposed to take a tablet every day. Now, I certainly think that's acceptable to do, but it is not necessary in many people for you to take a milligram every day. Why? Because the drug lasts a lot longer than a day in the system. If we go back to the idea that this is happening in the hair follicle, then it's not about the amount that you have in the blood that is most important, it's the amount you have in the skin tissue that's important. And a dose of finasteride lasts 30 days, minimum 30 days, inside the skin. So we really, in my opinion, and I'm saying it's my opinion, don't need to take this any every day. So basically what I ask my patients to do um, is take it probably on average about three times a week. Now you'd say, well, why not just take it once a month? Well, the body is continually creating new enzyme every day. So all we're doing is mopping it up. And in my experience, over 20 years using this dosing schedule, my results are the same in terms of being able to achieve stability as people who take it every day. So that is, for me, an important finding because the other side of that argument is that the number of patients in my practice that get any side effects on finasteride is correspondingly reduced because I'm asking them to take less of it. So key point here is that most people, in my opinion, that get side effects, it's because they're taking too much of it. And that's a critical thing because if we can adjust the dose and to down to a lower dose and still get the same effect without the side effects, then this most important medication we have could be used by many more men without fear of side effects or fear of the ability of it to harm their health or their partner's health. That's great. And so just to, again, to, to go through that again, the end point is we want to stabilize hair loss. So the key is what is the least amount of drug that we can put in our system that's going to give us that? Five milligrams is too much, and this is the and this is sometimes the problem because people are taking finasteride and don't know if it's one or five, and they're getting their you know their tablets from wherever. They're going to get problems when they're on on five. Again, taking a small dose of the medication, and you don't like like Russell was saying because it lasts longer than thirty six hours in the sorry it lasts longer than a day in the system. You don't need to take it on a daily basis. You just need enough to lower the DHT level to that threshold level that it doesn't cause progression of, of the hair loss. So the lowest dose that we can get away that will give us the outcome is inevitably going to give us the least amount of side effects as well. And here's a funny thing. Because the medicine had been around before it was used for hair, it was being used for the prostate, as I, as I said, we knew what the side effect profile was. And that uh, in a percentage of between maybe five to 8% of men using finasteride at the five milligram dose were getting sexual side effects. And by that I mean they had reduced libido, which is another word for sex drive, or uh, difficulty maintaining erections. So this is something we looked for and tested for in the original trials. And this is a very interesting point. In the original trial, they used 2,000 men, two groups of 1,000. Neither the doctor nor the patient knew whether they were taking finasteride or they were taking sugar, something we call a placebo, meaning it has no active ingredient. So we have a thousand men taking finasteride, we have a thousand men taking sugar. They don't know which, the doctors don't know which, they tracked them over a year. But they knew to ask for sexual side effects. So at the end of the year when they analysed the results and opened up the study to see who was taking what, they discovered that for the people that were taking finasteride, 1.8% of men had complained of sexual side effects. And that was probably a good figure because as I said, it was a higher figure if you were taking five milligrams. But very interestingly, and perhaps surprisingly, when they looked at the sugar group, 1.3% complained of sexual side effects. 3.5% difference. Correct. So basically, the, uh, the message here is that if you think you're going to get the side effect, you probably are going to get the side effect. 
So the reality is the way the psychology works in the brain, if you know it's possible and you really expect it, you could probably convince yourself that it happens. But it is a low incidence in real terms of side effect. So in my practice, I would say that it's less than that 1.8 because we're using a smaller dose like Vikram and I do. And so I think it's around about the 1% mark. Now, two things about this. Number one is I think that there's two categories of people that respond uh, by getting side effects. There are the people that respond immediately, meaning that happens in the first two weeks, okay? They are very sensitive to the medicine. The good news is if they get these side effects, this is the commonest side effect in the first two weeks, stopping the medicine means they recover in about two weeks. That's just, they always recover. In 20 years, I've never had anybody that didn't recover from their side effects. The second group are the people that don't get it immediately, they get it later. And this is a delayed response. So these are people that get it say between four and eight or maybe even longer months into therapy. And my reading of that is that because they've been taking it every day and it lasts, every tablet's lasting 30 days in your system, it's building up and building up and building up in your system. So if this happens later on, it's because you've got too much in your body. And so the simple thing is stop again and wait for it to recover. Now, these people recover very quickly. These people take a little bit longer, again, because of the length of time that's in the system. So don't be surprised in that scenario whether it took two, three months for people to recover. And that's normal. Again, I've never had a single patient in 20 years that did not recover after they stopped their medication. So if you're the person that gets it later on, it's a medicine you still could use, just a more customized dose. So there's two ways. You either lower the dose that you're giving to the patient or you lower the frequency. And the third thing you can do is you can let them take a month off whenever they want because you know it's gonna hang around for a month and that's gonna do you no harm. So stopping for one or two months is not gonna harm you in the long run. And that's something we get asked a lot, isn't we it? Get you asked. Know, if I'm gonna stop the medication, am I, gonna, am I suddenly gonna lose my hair? in that, you know, for a couple of months, if I stop the medication for a couple of months, am I going to lose all that ground that I, you know, was holding on to? And the answer is probably not, absolutely not. You know, no. if you're only stopping for a short period of time, letting it wash out of the system, you're going to be fine. Now, just to finish off the conversation about side effects and finasteride, the lesser common side effects that, that people get are they sometimes complain of a thing called brain fog, which means they just don't feel like they're thinking as clearly as they do. They can have tenderness of the breast, they can have tenderness of the scrotum, but these are really uncommon, really uncommon side effects. So it's fair to say that I have thousands of men, and Vikram has thousands of men in our practices that take this uh, you know, on a low dose schedule, mostly around about three times a week, with no problems whatsoever, and highly, highly effective at stopping further hair loss. To summarize. To su so to summarize, look, finasteride is a great drug and it's, it certainly forms for us the mainstay of uh, treatment modality and trying to stabilize uh, male pattern uh, hair loss. But we know that it's not without its problems. Part of the problem, and there are side effects, but part of it is from taking too much. So you're either taking a higher dose or you're take, even taking it too frequently. So I think this, the summary is, again, you should, if, you, if you're having issues, make sure you have that conversation. We see people all the time that come back to us and say, I've been on the medication, I'm not liking it because of X, Y, and Z. And then we modulate how they're taking. We might change the dose, we might change the frequency. We may, you know, slowly, gradually, uh, you know, you do this as well, gradually uh, uh, take a bit of a break and then gradually, uh, sequentially increase the dose over a period of few months because we want some of the blockade happening to give us some of that stability there. But the reality is the side effects, the incidence of side effects are very, very low. It is a very safe drug. We've been using it for many, many years and without any sort of problems. And there is a lot of, there's a lot of information on the internet which will scare a lot of people. But again, make sure you have a chat with the, uh, 
uh, a registered medical professional and seek appropriate advice. Would you say that's good? That's good. So the next episode of the podcast, we're going to discuss what patients really are interested in, which isn't so much stability. It's about whether we can increase their hair and grow their hair back. So that'll be the subject of the next podcast. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. And I hope you've found that this is somewhat helpful. So uh, I'd like to thank you for listening tonight. And uh, we look forward to talking to you next time. See you next time. Thank you.